that triathlon show 205. What's up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of That Triathlon Show, the podcast presented by scientifictriathlon.com. I'm your host, Michael, and on today's episode, we have another Scientific Triathlon Coaches Roundtable, where James, Lockie, and myself get together to discuss fatigue. How much fatigue is acceptable in your general training? How can you manage fatigue? And how do you adjust training and other lifestyle factors if you do end up carrying too much fatigue those are some of the things that we'll go into but before that big thanks to our sponsors first we have precision hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com and just over a week ago in the ironman world championships in kona ph had two sponsored pro athletes towing the line in sarah crowley and carrie lester both from australia Kerry finished third, having a fantastic race, just being overtaken by Lucy Charles Barclay in the closing stages of the run. And uh, Kerry also had a great race, finishing eighth, just two seconds from seventh, having stated pre-race that her goal was a top 10. And in an interview with Precision Hydration, they uh, were asked how they use Precision Hydration products in this particular race. And uh, so Sarah said that on race day, she will use BH1000 in the morning for preloading and pH 500 on the bike. And uh, Carrie said that she will use pH 1500 to preload and uh, pH 1000 during the race, plus sweat salt capsules during the run. You can get uh, advice for a hydration plan. You can actually get a complete free hydration plan on precisionhydration.com. Just click the free hydration plan tab in the upper menu and uh, you'll answer a few questions and uh, they'll then give you a complete hydration plan for use in your next race. You can get your first box or tube of precision hydration for free with the promo code that triathlon show, all one word, all caps, on precisionhydration.com. And thank you to Roka that you can find on roka.com. While we are waiting to hear if there was a swim skin count in Kona this year, one thing that uh, we can at least say with certainty is that in the women's race, Lucy Charles Barclay and Lauren Brandon who exited the water as first and second and uh, putting five minutes into the rest of the field, they were both exiting wearing their Roka Viper swim skins. And Roka have become the leading manufacturer of swim skins, as well as wetsuits, tri suits, goggles, and high performance eyewear for sports and casual day to day use. So you can find all their products on Roka.com and you can use the promo code TTS, all caps, to get 20% off your order. Without any further ado, here's the discussion on fatigue with Jane Stiegel and uh, Lachlan Kieran. So, hi, James and Lucky. Uh, it's uh, nice to have you back for another discussion. How are you guys doing? Hey, uh, yeah, doing well, yeah, I'm thank you. <laughs> yeah, good start. <laughs> Go on, like it. Yeah, it's all, it's always the the problem with having having your three people on the same discussion that uh, and you can't see each other. So yeah, uh, that's uh, a bit of coordination with that. But let's let's get right into the the topic. Uh, we got a listener question from uh, Sonde in Norway who wrote, uh, "Thank you for the great podcast and insightful content. Uh, my question is, how fatigued should you feel when training?" Uh, on the one hand, uh, I've heard the rule of thumb that uh, a training week should not be harder than for you to be able to repeat it four to five weeks in a row. On the other hand, they say you need to push your body to get super compensations after training. And uh, then uh, in the follow-up discussion with Sondra, he asked about some some things around how to evaluate fatigue and also some specific scenarios like what to do if you are just in the last hard week before an easy week and so on. But we'll get into these uh, these things uh, as uh, we go through the discussion. But the general topic here is how fatigued should you be when training and how to deal with and, and manage that fatigue. So I guess a good place to start is to to make some definitions i guess and discuss around fatigue in general and the first thing that that i think we should discuss is comparing acute fatigue with chronic or accumulated fatigue what's the difference between those and should we treat them differently so uh let's start with uh, lucky yeah well i mean if we roll back to that question um 
you know, I think the, the key point there is how fatigued should we be when we're training? So are we talking about um, for a, a single session or are we talking about throughout the course of the week? And I guess that's where we come to this acute versus um, chronic or accumulated fatigue, as, as you said. And um, I think when, we, when I consider acute fatigue, you know, it, it's usually fairly clear where that's coming from. So it might be, you know, a, a big session or it might be a session where, especially if it was a hot session, um, I, I find dehydration is something that really contributes to that kind of acute fatigue. Um, but when I consider acute fatigue, yeah, it, it comes down to one or two sessions or days in a row where we kind of see it um, come up. And, and I think it is quite manageable. And that's probably the difference between that real chronic fatigue, which um, can take a long time to alleviate. Um, that acute fatigue, usually to me, um, if, if we take the right steps, we can kind of get ourselves out of it fairly quickly in the scheme of things. Um, and then when I consider the, the chronic or accumulated fatigue, that's more that fatigue that we're building up over days and weeks and, and even months. And, um, you know, I guess the, the other thing I want to kind of point out for both of these things is that um, they're not necessarily just caused by training. So um, acute fatigue could be something like a poor night's sleep. Um, chronic fatigue could be, you know, the job has that you work at has become super stressful over the last few months, but you've been trying to just maintain the same level of training. And, um, you know, whilst the training hasn't changed, you've had this outside stress from work. And that's what's causing the accumulated fatigue. Yeah, James, I think that, that rounds up pretty well. Yeah, I mean, for me, acute fatigue is the fatigue that you, you know, you get from, from a hard training session. You can pretty much identify where it's come from, as Lockie said, and you can, you can, you know, you can alleviate it with rest, you know, if you're smart around it. Accumulated fatigue is, you know, that, that kind of fatigue that, like, as Lockie said, doesn't have to come from training, but, you know, builds up over time. Uh, it's just, you, know, you start feeling slightly more lethargic, you know, your, your training performance isn't, isn't quite so good. You, know, you start to have a bit of you know bad attitude to training or low, no motivation to life in general, and that's when you know you get an accumulated you know accumulated or, or chronic fatigue uh, is starting to kick in. It's just about managing that, you know, making sure that it doesn't get that far that it it does become chronic fatigue and it becomes a real a real issue. But yeah, I think I think Larky just summed that up pretty well, so um, I'll leave it there. Yeah, I, I agree uh, totally. Like if if you do a hard session, that there are certain types of sessions that. Uh, can take 48 hours to recover from. So that uh, two-day window that Lockie mentioned is, uh, could definitely be, be seen as just being acute fatigue and we don't need to be too concerned about having a couple of days when, when we are fatigued because that yeah, might, look- might just be like the immediate effect of, of one training session or a couple of sessions. But but if we get to like three plus consecutive days of fatigue, then that's where where we can consider it more accumulated and not probably not from just a single session and that's where we maybe need to start yeah i mean to dig, it's, it's, it's probably deeper. worth yeah i think i think sorry, it's also sorry, important to remember mention, that it's probably you know, worth uh, the two aren't mutually exclusive that, i mean you are going to feel some fatigue, fatigue and, you know, whatever training essentially program, program you do you there, know, there um, should be some element of fatigue too many bouts of um, acute fatigue without it. So enough, it's not completely you know, period for avoiding recovery fatigue, adaptation but, but just in between really what's a manageable level fatigue and so you know what's you know how do you achieve that accumulated fatigue is that you know, say, let's just say you can handle 100%, but you go to 110% over five days and that causes accumulated fatigue, or are you doing 101% for three months? Um, you know, if I was just using something like that, but, you know, there's there's many ways to get to that accumulated or chronic chronically fatigued state, um, but they all include, you know, bouts of acute fatigue that just aren't recovered from properly. Yeah, absolutely. It's that that balance between between stress and and recovery. So let's discuss then the different types of fatigue we can feel. And uh, I have a list of four here uh, that that I sent to you, but you might have something else to add that I didn't even think about. But but the ones that I have listed are muscular fatigue, a central or nervous system fatigue, and just general fatigue. I don't know if there might be a better term for that, but just feeling tired and fatigued in general in your day-to-day life. And finally, mental fatigue. Uh, so what are your thoughts about these? Should we treat them more or less the same or differently? Or do they uh, pose similar concerns if we have them for a prolonged period of time? Or are there some that are 
more concerning than than others. Uh, James, what are your thoughts? Um, so obviously, there's you know you identified those four types of fatigue. So um, you know I think generally fatigue fatigue is fatigue, and you know if it's coming from work, it's coming from life. It's you know it's, it's still fatigue. I think you do you do need to approach them slightly differently depending on which type of fatigue. So to the list of fatigues that I have are uh, metabolic. So that's the, you know, the excessive, you know, caused by excessive training, uh, with inadequate recovery, you know, you need a bit of that for part of normal adaptation, but, um, you need to also make sure you're recovering, you know, so you're actually getting a benefit from training. You got central nervous system fatigue. So that's a lack of, you know, um, lack of power production or a lack of, you know, a lack of good motivation when it's coming from a uh, neural fatigue. Uh, you got uh, peripheral nervous system fatigue, which is you know, more more localized and um, in your muscles. You know, you're feeling a lack lack of power and maybe maybe a certain muscle. So you know, it may be that uh, biceps or, some, or from something if you've done a lot of stuff in the gym or a lot of swimming. Uh, you know, you've got psychological fatigue. So, you know, if you're going up, coming up to a competition, you're feeling really nervous. You know, that's going to take a lot of energy out of you. You know, you're going to feel, feel the fatigue from that. Or, you know, maybe it's something that's completely out of training. So maybe it's, you know, monetary, maybe it's, you know, family related, maybe it's something going on, you know, something going on at home and, you know, that's going to add into your training environment and it's going to make you feel, feel fatigued. Um, and the final one I, I have, which I don't know how many people will identify as uh, environmental fatigue. So, you know, making sure that you don't become stale, making sure that, you know, you, you have something to, to motivate you and, uh, you know, something to get out of bed in the morning. So, if you, for example, if you're doing exactly the same thing, you're training with exactly the same people, you're training exactly the same place, you know, your training program isn't changing, maybe you're doing exactly the same nine to five job every day, uh, you know, you're going to be stale and, you know, that's what I deem environmental fatigue. Um, so, yeah, I think it's just, it's about managing those fatigues and like I say, each one does need need, need a different approach, um, but then fatigue is fatigue. So, you know, it's going to have an effect on your on your performance, no matter where it's coming from. Would you say, if uh, we continue with you for a while there, that uh, uh, one of them you need to react to quicker than others? For example, if you uh, if you have a bit of uh, like psychological fatigue, as you mentioned, it, you, a bit of lack of motivation, you can just push through it, even though you have that for like for a week or two. Whereas something else like the metabolic fatigue or or peripheral peripheral ner- uh, nervous system fatigue, where you feel that you you just don't have the power production in your muscles, that those maybe are a sign that actually you've pushed your body a bit too far so now it's time to to recover or how do you well how would you deal with those differences i think i think you've got to be you look at where the fatigue's coming from so you know i think i think it's dangerous to say you know you can just push through the mental fatigue i mean there will be there will be times where you can definitely push through it um but it's actually being you know being able to identify where, where that's come from i think this is something that athletes do struggle with a fair bit and you know the people doing triathlon are generally athletes who you know, are very motivated. So, you know, when it comes down to psychological fatigue, I think, you know, just being really careful and making sure, you know, if it is coming from a competition, then you know, just identifying that and being, okay, this is this is what's causing that. But if it's something else, if it's, you know, you're not enjoying your training, if it's, you know, something completely outside of training, then, you know, make sure that you're, you can't address that because it, it's not going to get any better unless it's addressed. Um, in terms of metabolic fatigue and, um, you know, central nervous system fatigue, then, yeah, you know, that's something you can address straight away and you don't want it getting too far. So, you know, if you let yourself, you know, become too fatigued in the metabolic sense, then then that will build up and it will become chronic fatigue or, you know, you'll get injured or something. So it's it's a fine balance. It's like walking a tightrope. Um, but you definitely don't want to let any of these fatigues get get too far. Lucky, what are your thoughts? Yeah, look, I mean, that was obviously a very good discussion and I, I tend to agree that there's probably some interplay between all of them and that's important to recognise. And I guess, you know, you pose the question at what point does it become concerning? And I think um, from a coaching perspective anyway, it's about, and I'm sure you guys agree, that any fatigue probably needs to be identified firstly. Um, and then, you know, over time we can decide if it becomes concerning but i think the first step really is actually identifying it and trying to pinpoint you know what that's stemming from and and as we kind of talked about before if we can look back and see you know there's there's a good reason for that fatigue and it's to be expected in you know an acute sense then um it's probably less concerning but if if we kind of look back and see that this is something that has been building up over time and you know if we're using something like training peaks um 
we can use a lot of, you know, both the objective and subjective data to kind of, you know, assess that. Um, I think that's probably the point where it becomes concerning. And, you know, I guess furthermore to that, um, it's certainly concerning if it's affecting your day-to-day life. So if it's affecting your ability to, um, you know, not only train, but go out and do everything else in life and, um, you know, keep your relationship strong and, and go to work and look after the family, all of those kind of things, um, then it's definitely a concern that's that's relevant to you and it's something that probably has to be addressed, you know, in your training. So with if, if we have identified uh, a certain type of fatigue and, and we sort of, we have also identified where it's coming from, that it might be the training load uh, versus recovery has been a bit too high or it might be something like your job has become more stressful. Can you just uh, give a couple of examples of uh, what the, the the solutions what what we what what we do to to get rid of that fatigue might be and there are some obvious ones of course but but maybe you have some some that are a bit less obvious so that the, the listeners can get an idea of of the different ways that we can sort of treat uh, these uh, different types of fatigue yeah look to me i think the big three that are probably you know the two that are most easily addressable is nutrition and hydration. I think both of those, no matter your situation, you can pretty much address those. So if if we kind of look back and see that perhaps there's been a lack of energy availability, um, that's fairly easily addressable in, you know, the very short term. Um, I guess another one is sleep. And, you know, I harp on about this all the time, but it's so important. And um, for some people that is an easy thing to address, but I also understand that, uh, if it's something like, you know, small children waking up in the middle of the night, it's not really something that, you know, we can address in that sense. So if it's something like that, I think we then have to look at the training and try and work out perhaps, you know, we don't train in the morning. It might just be that we have to back off a couple of mornings and stop getting up early to try and train and just give yourself a chance to actually have that extra couple of hours of sleep for, it could be a week, it could be two weeks, it could be more, but um, you know, if we're just going into training completely fried all the time, then um, we have to kind of assess if we're getting the benefit out of it that we want. So perhaps that means backing off the volume a little bit, um, but keeping the quality there. Yeah, I would, I would agree um, with that. that that's a, I, I guess. Sorry, go on. Sorry, I was going to say. I guess you know they're fairly obvious things. Um, you know, and around sleep, you know, things like sleep hygiene is, is also another thing that's just really easily addressable. Getting off, you know, the electronic devices, you know, 30 minutes before bed or, or whatever it is that works for you. Um, and I guess another one, and um, it's probably something that I've come on to a bit more lately, is just um, some things just re- surrounding your mental health. It might be meditation or um, mindfulness, that kind of thing. If you can find 20 minutes a day for that, I think. Uh, over time you know that can make a fairly big difference just in terms of um, your stress levels yeah and i think that the the research around meditation and mindfulness even points to that something like seven minutes might be enough i think i've seen something like that that the minimal effective dose is around seven minutes per day so so it doesn't have to be a lot uh, just has to be frequent Uh, yeah i I would agree oh well can if you consider the amount of time most people spend on social media every day i'm sure a lot could find 10 minutes yeah absolutely yeah, I think you're you're right on there with like nutrition and hydration. That if you that's an easy fix in many cases. You can keep your training load, but you might not be doing an optimal job with uh, with uh, replenishing glycogen and replenishing uh, lost fluid. So getting the fluid balance right in in your body, and that that way you can, in some cases, probably get get out of that fatigue without having to change training. And that's of course how you can sort of maximize the training that you can handle without. Uh, without changing the training load but but if that doesn't work and obviously sleep being another really big one then uh addressing the training load and uh and the recovery is is going to be probably what's what's necessary do, do you have anything for sure and i think oh, i just wanted to add um you know at any point if fatigue is affecting your biomechanics especially um running and, and swimming are probably the two where that is likely to happen then it certainly needs to be addressed because you know running we're looking at injuries swimming yes injuries as well but also just poor technique which is not something that we want to just be necessarily you know um digging ourselves a hole with poor technique all the time yeah james do you have anything anything to add to that uh, the only thing I'd add to that is just just to remember why you're doing the training. So you know you're not training to be tired. Um, and I think some athletes, you know, you know, I've, I've definitely coached some athletes in the past who definitely feel you know they've got to be tired from training. Uh, you're, you're training to be 
you're training to be a better athlete. So you're trying to do whatever you can to become a better athlete. And as, as you mentioned, you know, that involves rest. It involves, you know, nutrition. It invo- involves you know, making sure you're getting all the little things right, making sure you're stretching, making sure you get the mobility, making sure your head's in, you know, head's in a good place. So, you know, yes, accept fatigue, but but don't just keep training and training and training and think, you know, I've got to do this volume, I've got to do this intensity or or I'm not going to race well on race day. Just just have a have a think about actually, you know, is this the right thing for me? You know, maybe maybe if you've got a coach and you're lucky like that, that you can discuss it with them. But you, know, you don't want to be just just putting yourself in a hole and just just digging that hole. You know, it's not going to help you in the long run. You've got to be smart about the training you're doing. And you know, if you need to take a bit of a break, if you need to miss a couple of sessions, then 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 you know that's that's the right thing to do. Yep, uh, perfect. And uh, let's address the, directly the one of the questions or points that that Sonder raised in his uh, message here. Uh, he mentions there the on the one the one school of thought of uh, having weeks that are repeatable for four to five consecutive weeks versus uh, something that is also very common. For example, something like two weeks hard, uh, one week easy, or even three weeks hard, one week easy. Uh, for potentially better super compensation i think like it's difficult to uh, i don't think there's any evidence for that but but that's maybe the the thought behind that uh, what what are your thoughts around that specific theme like do you really want to the weeks to be repeatable over a longer term or do you uh, tend to follow more, something like a two to one or three to one sort of schedule i think in in terms of training it, it needs to be consistent so so whatever you do it needs to be consistent I, because consistency is is what really drives you know performance changes and you know actually adaptation i've seen obviously people do both these styles personally i prefer the you know four to five week repeatability with you know making sure you've got enough rest in there so so the first thing you do when you plan your training is you plan the rest so you put the rest in okay this is where i'm going to get you know the time the time might off so you know do all the work i need to do you know catch up on life you know be with family and, and you know obviously make sure that you're not getting not getting too fatigued um in terms of that then obviously that allows a lot greater consistency you know you can tick each week off uh with with a four to five week repeatability approach you know you want to make sure that essentially the weeks aren't the weeks aren't impossible so you know each week you should finish and you know you probably have a bit of tiredness but you know actually in the long run, you can take off each week, and you know it, you know it's doable. Um, so that that's the approach I go through for the, the four to five week method. And you know, at the end of four to five weeks, and you might consider having you know a rest week, um, you know, before you start the next block. In terms of you know two weeks, two weeks on, one week off. And I've seen I've seen a lot of athletes do this, and you know I've seen a lot of high level athletes do this, and you know I've seen a lot of high level athletes do the other the other method as well. Um, actually, in terms of that, I think it works really well if you know. If you're a person who, you know, pushes yourself quite hard and, you know, does have quite a lot of stuff going on outside your life, you know, maybe you've got a lot of stuff that just builds up and you need to get on top of. So, you know, training for two weeks, you know, fairly hard and then, um, you know, fairly hard, you know, with a wink face, you know, not, not, not massively hard, but consistently. Um, and having that, that week off where, you know, you can have a bit of downtime, you know, maybe pulling back the hours. So, you know, if you're doing 20 hours a week, pulling it back to 12, 12 hours a week, that, that kind of thing, um, catching up in all your admin work, um, but then just doing that consistently. So I think you know, as long as you're doing either method consistently, it, it can work. Um, it does definitely work better for some athletes than others, the two weeks on, one week off. Um, so I think you've got to play around your individual circumstances and, you know, play around with it yourself. But as an athlete, you'll probably find a, you know, have a preference for either, t- either two. I've one of the two. Um, but yeah, like I say, personally, because it allows more consistency, uh, you know, from my perspective and, you know, it allows you to, to take off a greater, greater amount of sessions, you know, in the long run without, without overdoing it. Um, you know, especially if you're not, not that controlled about the training you're doing, I do prefer the, the four to five week method. Um, what are your guys' thoughts? So just a follow-up question on that. Would you say then that you think that the two weeks on, one week off works best for athletes that have that specific scenario where they they really have a lot of things going on? So the one week off is also like really important for them to be able to catch up on things that they haven't had time to do in the two weeks on. And, and they might still, the training that they would do in more of a four to five week scenario might be a bit too high in terms of volume that they can really be able to get on top of all of those things. Would that be like a main determinant for you in whether that specific schedule is going to work for the athlete? Yeah, it, it will be a it will be a major determinant. For, so you know, 
if I'm honest, for me, I'd, I'd much rather go the four to five week because I think that that does allow more consistency. But that said, I know that for some athletes, that's not it's not going to be possible. Um, um, so actually, getting it's more consistent to do two weeks on, one week off. You know, because you know life just builds up, and uh, you know you need to get on top of that. It also gives you that bit of a mental break. So especially if you're doing very high volume, it gives gives you that kind of mental break to actually just just chill out a bit and you know um, pull back on the training. So I think yeah, it does depend on the athlete's circumstances. Uh, there's not a right or wrong. Um, either way I found to be successful with, with the athletes I coach. Um, but you know, it's, it's being selective about, about who you apply it to and, you know, actually knowing, knowing the athletes really well, or, you know, if you're coaching yourself, being honest with yourself and actually, you know, being able to apply the best strategy, but in the end you want, you want the consistency. So when you look back at it at the end of the year, it's, it's the consistency that, that really mattered. And what do you think about, let's say age groupers that are training around 10 hours per week, eight, eight to eight to 12 hours per week? Would uh, the forty-five week schedule work better for the majority of them, or or the too too hard one easy sort of schedule? I think you got you got to look at it actually what's going on outside their lives. So although they might be training ten hours a week, you know they might be working you know fifty-five, sixty hours a week if you know if you got a very high demanding job. So actually, if that's the case, you know two weeks on, one week off might might be not might be the best way forward. But then I think with with ten hours a week, you could probably be a bit more consistent you know without without knowing the athlete in general so you know don't apply this to yourself if you know it's a, it's a generalized term but um you know you can probably be a bit more consistent and you can probably consistently you know take off those weeks just ensuring you're getting enough enough rest in, in them and then like as i say at the end of a five week period then then potentially have that that rest week um but yeah it does depend on on your your personal circumstances outside of training as well as, as inside training yeah really good lucky what are your thoughts um look I I mean, when I kind of think about this, you know, this two weeks on one week off and, and catching up on stuff during that week, I, I tend to get a little bit worried in that scenario. Um, I think that's, you know, putting putting things off for two weeks and then spending your quote unquote easy week um, filled with a bunch of other stuff that actually in itself causes fatigue. Um, you know, maybe that is admin, maybe you're painting the house, maybe you're doing the gardening, um, whatever it is, I think. Um, eventually that catches up over time and, and eventually, you know, you start seeing these, these, that one week having all that stuff, but not being able to feel that stuff in that one week and it coming across onto the other two. And, and then does that, does that one week off actually, is it really truly an easy week? Um, and, and that's what I think we really have to consider here. Um, so in my perspective, I think that that, you know, two or three hard and then, and then one easy probably works best for, uh, the, the top end or elite athlete who has a lot of time and, um, you know, they're not necessarily doing much outside of sport. Um, in terms of the majority of people and, and certainly the majority of people that I coach, I, I do like that repeatability. And I think um, f- for self-coach athletes, I, I would like, to, I would probably say pick some some key sessions for the week that you really want to nail and, and adapt, you know, your training around those and when they fit based on what comes up in that week. If, it, if there's, you know, if it's a big work week with lots of nights and you have two key sessions that have to get done in the morning, then perhaps, you know, you, you need to adjust the rest of the week to reflect that and have some more sleep on the other days, uh, that kind of thing. But yeah, as James mentioned, I think the consistency over time for the majority of the year outside of specific race builds is um, to me the most important thing. And um, I guess that's what where all, what I'm always working toward in my athletes is just ensuring that we get that consistency over everything else. Um, because I think no matter how you look at this sport, uh, it, it does take time and consistency. And, and if we can nail that first, then I think that's probably our, our best road to um, success in the long term. Yeah, that, that is absolutely true. I think there are great arguments for, for both sides and, and as, as you both said, like you, you need to find what what works for the individual athletes. Where there's not a right or or wrong answer there. I think I find that something that I do quite often with an athlete is that it, the pattern sort of changes based on where they are in the season. So right now, if uh, we we're talking about athletes that have their racing season in sort of May through September, so they're maybe just coming back from from their time off now we would definitely aim for that something a week that is repeatable week in week out for a long long time but then as we get closer to the race in the race specific preparation that's maybe when we 
try to go for slightly harder weeks and and that's when when it might change to doing actually something like two weeks hard and one week significantly easier so uh so that's uh something that that quite a few of my athletes do it sort of the pattern sort of changes based on where where they are in the yeah, season and- so uh do, do you guys do anything like that with uh changing it based well, on the time to, of, of year just to say there um you know, I think the other thing to consider here is if we are going, you know, for that model where we're trying to find a bit of a structured week that fits around life, I, I think it's also important to remember that you should never be afraid to just take a week where perhaps everything's under 75%. You're certainly not going to lose any fitness doing that. Um, and if that's what is called for, you know, maybe you've only done one quote unquote hard week, but if if life happens and, and it requires an easier week, I, I wouldn't be afraid to put it in. Um, you know, I think that we have this, if we get into this rigid structure of too hard, one off or three hard, one easy, that, that kind of thing, um, we can sometimes you know, be sucked into having to hit those three hard weeks in a row and, and be afraid of putting in that easy week. Um, but yeah, as you said, and certainly it is dependent on, on where they are in the year. I think for a lot of athletes, they can definitely dedicate you know, maybe it's anywhere from six to 10 weeks to a specific race build. And, you know, it's throughout those, throughout that build, they kind of have um, a little bit more leeway into, in terms of what they can do and where they can put their energy. And I think during that time, we can probably consider some other, you know, techniques, if it is that three on one off or two on one off, that kind of thing um, into the race. But yeah, I think in other parts of the year, when we're in that more general quote unquote phase, um, then it's through those points that I think just having you know repeatable weeks is really important. Yeah, and I also think one thing that can have an impact here is how prone the athlete is to to fatigue. So, uh, so for example, somebody that is quite prone to fatigue but is still a a pretty good, pretty advanced athlete, then in those cases, maybe something like like a couple of harder weeks and one week easy might be good because they get a like a stronger sort of recovery block in there but also they get enough training stimulus to to improve if they're already at a good level if they're at a more beginner level then definitely having like something more sustainable is probably going to be to be better but but i think that that how prone the athlete is to fatigue has a big impact as well somebody that's less prone to fatigue uh, probably would or might do much better by having something that is more consistent over a longer period of time, like like four to five weeks. Yeah, and I think taking a back step there, you know, the first step always has to be actually being very realistic about what the minimum effective dose of training is. And I think for a lot of people, it's probably a lot less than, than what they imagine it is. Yeah, 100%. That's very true. So let's move on to assessing fatigue and uh, there are definitely various things that we can that we can use both objective and, and subjective uh, but uh, what are your thoughts around uh, different objective and subjective measures uh, when when are we actually fatigued and do you have any like thresholds that you that you use to decide whether an athlete is fatigued or not so James uh, let's uh, start with you so, so in terms of fatigue, so you, I use things like uh, heart rate and heart rate variance. So, you know, if your heart rate starts getting, you know, very low, then you know that that's a sign of fatigue. You know, obviously we use heart rate variance, and you know, a lot of a lot of people do use that, and it is really useful for monitoring training as long as you do it consistently. Um, but I don't think every athlete needs to do that. For me, the most the most important, the most the most effective way of actually monitoring fatigue and monitoring fatigue in the athletes I coach is by just asking them. I don't think, you know, that conversation can be replaced. So you have that conversation with the athlete. You have a, you know, even if you're being not being coached, you know, have a conversation with someone else and actually, does this look like fatigue? Does it look like unsustainable fatigue? I think, you know, actually having that communication and having that discussion, you know, on a day-to-day basis is the best way, you know. So if you're coaching an athlete, you, you build up a relationship with them. You know what their normal looks like. And you know what their, their fatigue looks like. And, you know, from that, you can identify actually, you know, are they pushing too hard or, or are they not? Obviously, you've got things like, you know, sleep disruption, um, you know, uh, not eating so well, you know, having a bad attitude to life, uh, you know, low motivation, feeling lethargic, all, all of that adds up. But actually, I think the best way of you know, catching fatigue early is just, just to have that honest and, you know, frank discussion with your athletes as, or the athletes you coach as, as much as possible. 
So I think obviously you can use things like heart rate and heart rate variance and, you know, all of the technology that goes along with it. But I don't think that's replaced actually that, that conversation and that actual, you know, face to face human, human interaction or, you know, just the communication. So how, how do you, how do you determine if, uh, if you need to change training using, uh, well, then uh, the, that conversation and subjective feedback as, uh, the primary, uh, primary measure of, of fatigue is it by asking the athlete so so for how many days has this been going on and if it's for like too many days then you decide that okay we need to to address this uh, is is that sort of how how you do it well so f- first of all you know for the training plans you know so for the athletes you know the ap- training i give my athletes obviously you're trying to avoid you know excessive fatigue there should be an element of fatigue though in in their program um so it's identifying you know actually is it is it just fatigue from from a certain session that actually you'd expect it or is it is it accumulated fatigue is it getting too much you know is there those outside factors and i think having that having that conversation with the athlete allows you to identify that so you know you could have put you know the best the best training plan the best training structure in you know that's, that's ever been made but um actually you know you don't realize that you know the athletes you're coaching or you know if you are coaching yourself actually something from work, you know, really kicks off and actually you've got a big project on at work or, you know, something like, like we mentioned earlier, maybe, maybe family life, something like that. Some, something's not going so well that there wasn't planned. Um, and suddenly that becomes a big fatigue factor. Now, as a coach, you know, maybe you're just on training peaks. You, you can't see that. All you can see is, okay, so they ticked off this session. Well, you know, this session was a bit b- below par, you know, the heart rate was a bit low on the tempo, but yeah, it was okay. Um, you know, that kind of thing is what you see on training peaks. Uh, but actually, Having that that face to face or you know that that discussion on the phone or, or whatever uh, allows you to to make those decisions where actually you're you're taking into account all the variables and you know once you've been coaching an athlete for a while you know that you know what their their individual circumstances are you know what's normal for them so actually you can identify you know is this going to be a lot of fatigue that you know you weren't expecting and you know is it is it something that that's unusual and if the case is yes then then maybe you need to adapt what what you have planned and you know focus on it in a, in a different way. Lucky, what are your thoughts around this question? Yeah, look, I think in terms of objective measures, um, you know, I think I've probably got a fairly good bank of data just coming off Melbourne winter um, with sickness going around and stuff. And you can certainly see, especially with heart rate, um, you do see that elevated heart rate for a few days, um, as long as the athlete's fairly consistent on when they're taking it uh, in the day. Uh, if it's just upon waking, um, you know, I've had a few examples this year where you can kind of see, um, you know, the family's been sick and, and the, the heart rate's just coming up over a few days. And lo and behold, um, they they do end up on the verge of sickness potentially. Um, in terms of in terms of HRV, I guess I've personally used um, HRV for training, which um, I think is is a very good program. Um, do I use it? with my athletes, uh, their day-to-day recommendations. I, I mean, not really. If you wake up and have, you know, your HIV is, you know, severely depressed one day, I don't think that's necessarily a cause for concern. I think, you know, there are a lot of factors that can play into that. And if you took the measurement two hours later, you'd probably get a different number. But if we're seeing um, a trend over time where HIV is, is, is really down, then that's when we kind of have to look into it, I think. Um, and and I've had a few athletes working with the whoop strap lately. Um, I guess what we've found with that is that the first uh, month or so is certainly a bit of a teething period where it's um it's kind of getting a bit of a, a vibe about your body and how you work. So, um, yeah, the first month with the whoop strap, I, I found with my athletes tends to be a little bit up and down in terms of the recovery scores. Um in, in terms of sleep, uh, you know, sleep monitoring devices, how accurate are they? I'm not necessarily sure, but um, you know, if we're seeing if an athlete is self-reporting lack of sleep or, or bad sleep, I think that's a, a fairly good indication if it ties in with some other things. You know, if we're seeing decreased performance or high RPE in the training, then you know we can put two and two together fairly fairly quickly. Um, in terms of uh, subjectively, I think that a really good litmus test for a lot of athletes and and including myself and I'm sure you guys will agree is is swimming especially swimming without equipment um you know I think I think when you you are genuinely very fatigued that you see that swim form um is the first thing that that really suffers 
Um, so if athletes are reporting that they're really struggling in the pool to maintain body position and a good stroke, um, especially for longer intervals, then I tend to find that is a really good indication that potentially we need to take a step back on some of the, the biking and running. That's a, that's a very good point. Yeah, yeah I mean, that's a, that's a really – yeah, I was going to say the same. <laughs> yeah, uh, swimming definitely, you know, you definitely see the fatigue first, you know, unless you've got a real, you know, pure swimmer from a pure swim background, which is, you know, the only – exceptions i can think of you know knowing people who who are who are that but yeah generally with most triathletes you know i agree the swim form is the first thing that goes and you can really identify the fatigue from that yeah so yeah i mean that's worth bearing in mind i'll add a couple of points here um yeah i think for me the the most important uh, objective measure is uh, actually performance if uh, if you see reduced performance for one or two days then it's not uh, a cause for concern but again it's that trend like if you see it I tend to think about like a, a three-day rule. If something happens for three consecutive days, so you have reduced performance for uh, three consecutive days, or maybe it's three consecutive uh, quality workouts. It doesn't have to be three consecutive days necessarily. But uh, that is uh, a cause to at least uh, look into things and uh, and dig a bit deeper and and ask the athlete how, how they're feeling. And, uh, and that definitely should be combined with uh, the perceived fatigue and the uh, perceived effort in in those workouts which the athlete should should be reporting how they're feeling and if that trend also is that uh, they're feeling more fatigue or they, they have to uh, put out a bigger effort to hit their numbers then uh, that's uh, that's to me is a sign that that we might be be accumulating fatigue and and again accumulating fatigue it depends on how much you accumulate and uh, it doesn't mean that we should change things but at some point you need to take the decision if you think that maybe we're accumulating too too much fatigue but then uh, yeah look then so, oh, yeah go on oh, i was just going to say you know um, it's probably harder in the swim but if we're looking at the bike um just completely objectively um heart rate to power or heart rate to pace or in the, in the run the same thing heart rate to pace um i tend to think if it, if we're looking at sub sub kind of threshold intervals um you know we want to see the heart rate to power or pace come down over time but if we're then looking at um you know you know high end vo2 max interval kind of things if if we see the heart rate actually being lower and suppressed i think that's you know a good sign of fatigue as well um you know i don't think it we should always correlate a lower heart rate to power as necessarily a sign of gaining fitness sometimes you know it is actually suppressed um because you're tired yeah absolutely i i've definitely been there myself where i had super low heart rate for my sub threshold um just easy endurance running and uh, my heart rate to power or heart rate to pace would have been fantastic, but uh, it was definitely uh, at the point of uh, too much accumulated fatigue. But but what you say there with, uh, I think, the suppressed heart rate, lower heart rate in, in those high-intensity intervals, that's a really good place to sort of identify fatigue as well. Uh, that I do, I do use HRV uh, quite a lot. I think that it's great. I also use HRV for training like you and and to me it's brilliant but it's not in isolation it's not uh, completely re- reliable you need to combine that as well with things like performance data self-reported sleep quantity and and quality uh, even motivation and and of course those performance and perceived fatigue metrics but but i do think that hrv and resting heart rate they they do provide really really uh, good additional information to to make you to to help you make better better decisions and and i i think that it correlates really nicely with uh, quite often when you look at uh, how the baseline the train trend changes rather than just day-to-day variations which may be outliers there, there might be various reasons for a one day where it's off but but when you look at the baseline whether it's stable or going up or going down that's that's when you really get i uh, can make some really good yeah and difference. just i mean if you were to simply train off what the hrv for training app, for instance, told you today, I don't think that it would be a bad thing. Um, is it optimal? I'm not sure. But, um, yeah, I certainly don't think that you would find yourself in a bad position and doing not enough intensity if you followed it, um, having used that quite a lot myself. I, I agree. And actually, it's uh, funny that you mentioned it because I'm uh, planning to now during this uh, general preparation phase, at least a couple of my athletes were actually going to try that uh, for them to, uh, like, 
really train according to to that advice. We'll have some specific instructions around how to interpret the HRV reading. So it's not necessarily exactly what the app says, but how we interpret the HRV with all the information that's out there now. But there's also a couple of, uh, or at least three or four, I think, really good studies where they've done that HRV guided training versus uh, just following a rigid structure. But that's not what you should do anyway. A rigid structure, like you should always, of course, have your head in it so whether you use hrv or not you should be able to make make adjustments when you if you just feel like crap or things like that so so it's not maybe a fair comparison in those studies but those studies studies have seen good results for hrv guided training yeah i think you need to need to stay in you know hr is is very very important um you know and it's very useful um i think just just bearing in mind that you know you should probably stay in in tune with your feelings so not relying on it you know as you say you know you're going to try and use it as as a, as the guide, um, but I think it's also important you do you know recognize what those feelings feel like. So you know, as an athlete, you can recognize what what fatigue feels like. So you're not completely reliant on it, just in case you know, for whatever reason you don't have it, or you know just to just better yourself as an athlete, just just so you can identify actually you know I am feeling fatigued, and actually in the long run, you know your experience builds up, and you know so you can identify it before before it comes an issue uh, in the future potentially. If if you don't have access to technology for whatever reason, maybe you go on a training camp and maybe you lose, you know, you lose your heart rate monitor, uh, that kind of thing. So actually, you know, using the technology, but also making sure that you have, you know, the ability to to make those decisions, you know, from from your own experience as well. For sure, that that's the most important, even more important than performance, because maybe your power meter stops working it's out of battery or whatever and then or it's just not measuring accurately so then you even lose that ability to to use performance to to identify fatigue so at the end of the day like your perception of your body being in tune with your bodies is uh, absolutely the most important thing mm. So if we discuss like when is uh, fatigue, what, what is an acceptable level of fatigue, especially when it comes to like accumulated fatigue and, and when, when do we make changes? Uh, Larky, how, how do you, uh, when, when would you uh, make changes to something, whether it's training or maybe just telling the athlete, look, you need to eat more or you need to sleep more or whatever it is. When, when is the fatigue level that you identify big enough that you would make some sort of change? Or intervention well i think if we you know look at probably the biggest picture if we i never want an athlete to get to a point where they're just not enjoying the sport anymore because the reality is you know we, the reason that we're doing this is enjoyment and um no matter what level you're at if it's you know i'm sure yarn wouldn't be doing triathlon anymore if he didn't like it um there's plenty of other things he could be out doing so you know the the underlying you know thing for all athletes is enjoyment of the sport so um if i see an athlete getting to a point where you know motivation is is very low and i see them you know going towards that then i'm 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 quite worried so um you know i think you know when we talk about those different kinds of fatigue um does that necessarily mean you know if it is a motivation thing and a bit of a mental fatigue does that necessarily mean that we have to put in an easy week i'm not so sure perhaps you know in that case it might just mean that we have to put in a week with a lot of variability in terms of you know it might be terrain it might be be the session type you know giving the athletes a bit of freedom to go out and just do what they want for a week and be unstructured you know that could be the solution it doesn't necessarily have to be um let's just cut back 50 percent of the hours or x amount of intensity um you know so i think that's probably one consideration look and if we're talking about um uh, objectively uh if i see more than kind of three or four days of elevated morning heart rate i, I will have a conversation with the athlete and james touched on that before i mean yes the, the objective stuff is important but um it's also important to have a, the conversation you know if if we're just looking at training peaks it doesn't really mean much you know the athlete might say oh well actually you know two of those readings were after i had three coffees and uh it was you know i just forgot to take it in the morning you know that's not something that you'd necessarily see so um you know i think that's important as well um in terms of actual performance you know i i don't think that we want to get to a point of fatigue where you know athletes are unable day in day out to push at least the intensity that they have been previously 
um, unless there's been a break or something. You know, if they've been training consistently and we're seeing performances start to decline, then I think that's probably a worry, you know. Um, that's probably when we need to take a step back and understand why that's happening. And um, at that point, I think we need to probably have a bit of an intervention and, and make a plan of attack to, to get back to where they were. What, what for you is the like the threshold there for, I mean, there, there's got to be some margin of error. So if last week they did their sweet spot intervals at 300 watts and this week they do a very similar workout at 295, it, would that be acceptable? And, and what is sort of the too too much of a change compared to last week where, well, where you would consider it like not hitting the same level? Yeah, well, I mean, I also think you have to consider um, – are they even starting the reps? You know, I think that's probably, if we get to a point where they're going, I can't even, I'm doing one or two reps and I'm just completely fried. And last week they were doing eight. That's definitely a worry, right? But if it was 300 watts and this week they did 280, but they still got, you know, the same, they still got 60 minutes of work done. Well, you know, we all know that say threshold in any sport isn't, it's an ever moving target, right? Like day to day, it's not the same. Um, it's merely just a measure of what where you were on a certain point on a certain day, and we use that for zones or or levels or what it, or ranges, whatever you want to call it. But the one thing all those things have in common is that they are a, a range. That you know, it's never just a set target. Um, and I think that's probably changed a little bit in the last couple of years with the introduction of erg mode um, to the masses. Um, I think that probably. Uh, you know, athletes will just chase a number that's set on erg mode and, and week to week not change it and not listen to the body so much. So, um, you know, we're kind of working backwards in that sense where instead of looking at, say, the power um, to perceived effort, you know, that they, they, you know, previously they might have just gone at 7 out of 10, say, um, and the power would be what it would be, whereas now they're, they're just going to go at the same power and, and then we have to address, well, was the perceived effort where it wanted to be? Was the heart rate where it should have been? And and if those things aren't right, then we can address fatigue in that sense. So, um, you know, I mean, I think, you know, heart rate, if it's more than, you know, f- five or 10 over for, say, you know, 20 minute uh, intervals, then you're probably a little bit worried that there's something going on there. And, um, you know, if you're seeing athletes trying to do VO2 efforts and they're not getting above, 70.3 heart rate then again you know you, you're kind of a little bit worried that it's 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 suppressed for some reason and it's probably a good sign to back yeah. off you know what you touched on there with erg mode and like rigidly trying to stick to a number i think that's probably one of the biggest reasons that uh, athletes get too much accumulated fatigue in the first place uh, rather than trying to like just hit, go at the say the uh, the perceived effort for let's say sweet spot intervals or via two max intervals and letting the power be what it be then of course yeah, if the if, if the power is like way too low then maybe you don't do the hard workout that day but but it, it should be allowed to to change in, in both directions if if your effort is right it's uh, it's the same and your heart rate reacts normally but but that thing with with athletes really always trying to push that number or even like going higher week to week that's probably like what leads to 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 a bit too much uh stress on days when when maybe you should go a little bit easier even though you would do the quality workout and that then in the end leads to too much accumulated fatigue yeah and i don't blame i mean i don't blame the athlete for that i think it's just um it's just a consequence of of the technology and it's been around long enough that now you know there's a lot of athletes that their whole progression through the sport has been through that model. So um, I don't think that, you know, you can, um, you know, blame the athlete for that. Whereas you know, athletes that have been around a little longer, probably, you know, they, they started out the sport on, you know, if they were doing indoor riding on say, you know, quote unquote dumb trainers. But um, in those situations, a lot of the training was around, um, you know, heart rate and power and perceived effort all being integrated into that, into that session and, and making calls based on the combination of all three. Um, whereas now, yeah, I think that it is easy to lose um, sight of, of feel for certain effort levels. And that, as James touched on, you know, that, that, that also is important when you come to races, but that's a whole another can of worms. I think just, just going back to the point you made earlier about, uh, you know, actually when is it, when is training too much? I think, you know, 
uh, actually looking at, you know, you can't, we've, we've mentioned this a lot today. Uh, you know, you can't just identify one thing and say, look, that you're over, you're over training, you know, you've, you've got too much fatigue. I think, you know, generally when I look at sessions and, you know, if they've done a bike session, maybe they've done a run session and maybe their VO2 heart rate's been suppressed, um, you know, maybe they haven't hit their numbers on the bike, then, then, then once you've got a few sessions like that, then you, you can definitely say that they've, they've def- become fatigued or you've become fatigued. Obviously, you're trying to avoid that that happening in the first place, really, uh, and you're trying to make it as consistent as possible. But I think it's just avoiding going to one session and, you know, doing a bike session where you know, maybe your power is down by, by 15 watts and, you know, suddenly, you know, it's the end of the world, you've, you're fatigued, you know, you've, you've overtrained, you know, you've gone past that point of overreaching. I think, you know, and, you know, athletes are very emotional when it when it comes to things like that and you know they can be quite reactive after training sessions but actually I think just taking that step back and actually looking at things in the bigger picture and you know like you say if you've got a couple of days where where actually you know you've been fatigued and you know your sessions haven't been so good then then making that decision to, to you know to, to pull back a bit on the training and you know maybe just bring the volume or the intensity down slightly um, but actually yeah just just making sure that you know you're not reacting to sessions and you know you've, you suddenly had one bad session and actually it's it's the end of the world um just just taking things in the bigger picture really yeah i think that's great advice actually being able to you know leave a session in the past and and being happy with what you achieved is, is certainly a super important one yeah absolutely i i think like i tend to to agree with uh, like like you mentioned three to four days i like for me it's like if there's three consecutive days of something is uh, seems to be out of of the norm so it might be perceived effort is much higher performance is much lower and or we might be, have like high resting heart rate low hrv it whatever the the cause for concern might be if we have three consecutive days of cause causes for concern then that's when 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 we need to have a discussion and uh, and then based on that see whether some adjustment is needed and try to identify the, the root cause of of the fatigue whether it's training or, or something outside of training and uh, make adjustments if needed and, and as needed so so i think that that yeah three days or maybe four days would would be a good rule of thumb but uh, but again like you need to look at the big picture and uh, and definitely not like have there's no formula or equation and and i don't think there's anything scientific about three days either but it's just that at some point you need to at least make some some sort of root cause analysis or or dig a little bit deeper yeah. and that's in my opinion it's, it's been working well to to do it after three days so let me see here uh, we have a couple of more short ish questions and uh, uh let's uh let's discuss like how far this is one something that Sonder mentioned in his uh, follow-up question uh how far should you push in uh, the specific race prep uh before you go into taper like how if we just discuss this from the perception of like how how much fatigue do you do you feel should you feel do you think that we in general athletes in general get it right or are we perhaps pushing too much or or not enough in that period what what are your thoughts on on that race specific prep before going into taper so so this is you know this is one of those things where you go oh not that again but actually um for me it's down to to the athlete um so actually you know if if you've got a good history of being able to push yourself fairly hard you know and actually recover pretty well off the back of you know decent amount of training then then you know push yourself to that to that limit where actually you know you are feeling slightly fatigued uh you know well, not slightly fatigued quite fatigued before you go into your taper but then if you've got an athlete who you know potentially is you know maybe slightly older or you know maybe you know doesn't doesn't recover that well off, off a big block of training uh, and likes to be really, really fresh going into races, then, and you know, then actually, you know, make sure you don't push yourself too hard. At the end of the day, you know, consistency, as I keep banging on about, is is what makes you a good athlete. So consistently, consistently training hard or consi- not, not consistently training hard, consistently training, uh, you know, and following, following a structure that, you know, you know, brings on your brings on your ability level is what's important so actually you know you shouldn't get to the end of that preparation period and think look I've got to smash it now because actually you know I'm not I'm not where I need to be you, know, you should have been consistently building it up to that period um I think yeah you've also got to look at actually is this is this specific race is it is it a key race for me was it an a race and if, if it's an a race then yeah okay it's probably okay to take a bit more rest because actually you know you don't mind you know, not not doing too much training um, in into it, and actually, you know, there isn't too much off the back of it that you're you're too worried about. 
uh, definitely being fresh into races is something that you know has a massive impact. And for me, you know, personally, it's it's actually and this is something that I've been I've been struggling with as an athlete myself. Is actually you know it's it's quite remarkable how how fresh you can get um, without without you know without getting unfit. If that, if that makes some sense, if that makes sense. So actually being not being afraid to take that time off and not being afraid to not not time off, but not being afraid to, to pull back on the training a bit uh, going into races. Um, you know, I think at the end of the day, you want to do yourself, you know, the best service possible as an athlete. Um, so, you know, you want to make sure you, your training you've done has been has been absorbed and actually is is actually going to benefit you on race day. Yeah, look, I, I totally agree there. And I also think, um, you know, if you're getting to that last Sunday before a week and just praying for the taper, then, you, you, you know, I think you're hoping for a bit of a miracle. Um, you know, I think I totally agree with you that learning to be okay with a day off or, um, you know, a, a light day is very important. And, um, you know, I think a lot of uh, age groupers would be really surprised with, um, you know, some of the professionals and, and the fact that a lot of them do take a full day off or adjust a swim day, um, that kind of thing. It's very common. So um, I think it's really important to know that, that having a day off or an easy day, even once a week, is certainly not something to be frowned upon. I think that uh, the way you put it there with like if you get to the Sunday before the race and praying for taper start, then yeah, that that's spot on. Then you <laughs> know that you probably overdid it a bit when, with with your combination of of pushing pushing a bit too hard or and not having enough time to recover. I think that's something that I think that I see like I see in a lot of age groupers that uh, sure you might you can have a block when you push hard, but actually then it takes more than a week to to fully recover from that and get fresh. So you will probably need a two week taper uh, at least for that. And some professionals they start the tapering three weeks out from their key race. Something like like Kona might might start three weeks out from for for some of those athletes. Yeah, look, I'm I'm only talking for ex- from experience. I've been I've definitely been on the Sunday praying for a taper, and uh, I can tell you from my n equals one that it has never worked. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that one thing that we let's actually, because Lucky, you have a coaching call coming up. So we need to wrap up with some final take home messages and practical advice. So uh, let's uh, start with with you, Lucky, and then you can jump off whenever you need to. Uh, so thank you in advance for, for coming on here. But what's your final take home message and advice to the listeners? Look, I think probably if I could take one thing away from this, it would be what I just said, and don't be afraid um, to take some time to adapt to the training because, you know, training is one thing, but actually adapting to it is another. And and that's what we want. If we're not getting adaptations to the training, then it's, it's really quite useless apart from, you know, just being fun, which don't get me wrong, is very important. Um, but I think, you know, trusting in yourself to, to back off, um, it is a really important thing and I very, very rarely see an athlete that, um, you know, trusts themselves too much to back off. You know, everyone who I see and uh, especially, you know, in age group racing, you know, they could certainly do with a little bit more recovery. So I think you just need to be, you know, really confident to, to take that. James, what uh, would you like to end with? Um, so, yeah, similar message. I just think, you know, as an athlete, you've got to be, you got to be prepared to take that recovery and actually, you know, make sure that you, know, you are getting the best out of your training. So you know, you're training hard, but actually making sure you're getting, you're getting that time to, to adapt. I think as an athlete, you want to, you want to make sure that you don't, you don't repeat mistakes. And let's be honest, there will be times, you know, no matter who you are, where you, you have pushed too far and actually making sure that you identify the factors of you know what what scores that and you know what what that feel like and actually making sure you you don't repeat it again. I mean, if you make a mistake once, then that, that's that's you know it's a learning experience. If you make a mistake more than once, then then it's something that you know you probably should have should have identified and you know you, you could you know you could have done better really. Um, so just just taking every opportunity you can to learn about yourself and learn about actually this is how it feels. You know, this is what my data looks like when I'm getting fatigued. This is what this is what works for me. This is you know what. What, what allows me to be consistent in training and actually applying that um, you know, on a weekly basis? Yeah, well, 100% agree with, with both of you. Uh, I'll add one, one thing, and that is that uh, your body has no idea what you had planned, what, what you set 
your training schedule to be or what your coach sets your training schedule to be or what your uh, pre-made training plan uh, says that you should do it only knows what you're actually doing so uh, again don't be afraid to adjust based on on how you feel but also those uh, other objective and, and some subjective markers because there's no perfect training plan and uh, but adjusting and adapting to the training to to optimize for maximum adaptation rather than maximum training is is the goal of, of training and that's that's how you'll do do really well so thanks guys for coming on it was a, a great discussion and uh, we'll uh, have uh, another discussion probably in in a few weeks time again because i really enjoy doing these episodes with you so thank you great thanks michael speak to you soon Hope that you enjoyed that episode. As usual, you can find the show notes on thattriathlonshow.com and you can find links to related episodes, including previous episodes with uh, Lockie and James, as well as uh, the episode on non-functional overreaching that I did with uh, Cyril Schmidt in episode 159. Let us know what you think of these coaches' roundtables. We're very eager to hear your feedback and how we can make them even better and more enjoyable and educational for you. If you do like them, and if you like the podcast in general, a rating and a review on iTunes or the podcast platform of your choice would be amazing. Uh, so please do that if you haven't already, and if you get value from the podcast. It only takes a minute, but it means a massive amount for the podcast and in helping it be discovered by, by more athletes and triathletes in particular. Big thanks before we go to Roka that you can find on roka.com. Take 20% off your entire order with the promo code TTS, all caps. And thank you to Precision Hydration that you can find on precisionhydration.com. Get a free hydration plan and get your first box or tube of Precision Hydration electrolytes for free with the promo code that's Triathlon Show, all one word, all caps. Thank you, as always, for listening. Keep training smart and keep loving triathlons.